Good evening, everybody. Uh, I, I hope you're enjoying your, your dinner. I will obviously leave you some more time to visit, to socialize. But I did want to introduce Robert Scher. Uh, Robert is an alum, as I mentioned before. He's been a CEO since 1984. And he acts as a consulting CEO today, helping business leaders as they navigate critical uh, business issues and passages in their companies. He uh, first uh, crossed paths, I guess, with St. Mary's in 1986 when Robert came to earn his MBA. We've been privileged and honored that he chose to come back and uh, act as a, as a teacher, which is always wonderful when a professor comes back who is already a CEO, uh, instructing folks in perhaps some of the pitfalls. And uh, I'm very pleased to, uh, to introduce Robert. He's, he's just uh, published a book um, which is called The Feel of the Deal. Uh, we have a copy for you, as Robert will explain. Um, and uh, we, we, we really are pleased to welcome him back to, to learn about his experiences with his MBA, with, as a professor at St. Mary's, and uh, some ideas about what it meant to be a part of this community. Robert, Robert Chern. Good evening. So I'm a, a consulting CEO, which means I'm always driving here and there, meeting with people. And despite my best planning, there's always big gaps in between the meeting. Uh, I remember back in the middle of July, I ended up with a, a meeting with a venture capitalist at 8.30 in the morning in Palo Alto. And the only other thing I could get that day was a 1.30 lunch in Los Gatos with a business broker. Two dead hours in the middle of that. And I cram work into every nook and cranny of my schedule. And I've got news for you. You'll be doing the same thing, cramming work and studying in every nook and cranny that you've got. So I made a mental note the night before to bring my laptop so I could drive to my lunch and, and I had to write a, a CEO case study uh, for a column that I run in the San Jose Business Journal. So I took care of my morning meeting. I drove down to the parking lots in, in Los Gatos and I reached around to the back of my car and I realized that that mental note I put in my brain hadn't stuck. I had no laptop. Way too hot to sit in the car. I just got out of the car and I walked over to California Cafe. To get in front of California Cafe, I walk up and there's like 15 benches. I'm thinking, why are there so many benches in front? It's a huge restaurant. And I'm staring at one of those benches, kind of thinking, what am I going to do with these two hours? And I had a flashback, 20 years back right here to my advanced marketing class, Professor Alex Wong. Now, Professor Alex Wong was, oh, there's, there's too many of you here. Um, he was, let's just say, we students never knew what to inspect when, when, when Professor Wong walked in the door. It's always a surprise. So one day he walks in and he says, we're gonna talk about part time. And all of us students are kind of going, okay, what's this gonna be about? Well, he had this philosophy that here in the mid-1980s, with technology coming on strong, you know, fax machines were proliferating, and a cordless phone, everybody was getting one of those cordless phones, and he was convinced that pagers, with the price coming down, everybody was gonna have a pager really soon. He said, executives don't spend enough time thinking. They're interrupted by pagers and all this stuff, and they're always doing stuff, but they're not really focusing and thinking. And so he begged us, he said, look, at least two or three times a week, maybe every day, go to the park and sit down on a bench with nothing, no paper, no pens, no calculators. We all had to get an HP 12C back then. That was required hardware for the program. None of that. And you just sit there and you think about your most deepest complicated problem. And he said the first 15 minutes is going to be tough because you're going to be thinking about the list and this and that. You'll be distracted, but keep at it. And he said the second 15 minutes you'll start getting some really good answers because you'll have focused your mind all the way in. So I said, you know what? I got two hours. I sat down on that bench right in front of California Cafe in Las Gatos. And again, I focused my mind and followed Professor Wong's advice. And as promised again, I got some really good answers for a marketing problem that I'd kind of been stumped on for about a month. So as a student, I was here and I learned something from Professor Wong. And I applied it in practice 
a number of times, but on July 12th as well. And now here I am tonight teaching it to you. So I learned it, I practiced it, and I taught it. And those three things are what I call the cycle of growth. And I've used learning, practice, and teaching in my life, and it's really shaped who I am and what I've become. And if you do the same thing, if you weave learning and practice and teaching together, it'll make your life rich as it's made mine as well. Now, I'm going to reel you all the way back to 1985, when my six years of undergraduate work finally came to a close. I know, six years. But I've been running a small business all those years, so that's slowed my schooling down. That's my excuse, and I'm, I'm sticking with it. But the lessons I've been learning in those six years have been helping me all along. In fact, there's one memory that's just permanently stuck in my brain. And it came from the quantitative methods class. Now, nobody liked the quantitative methods class. You know, you probably can guess why. But worse yet, this professor was horrible. He was very, very boring. But I was sitting there, Hayward State, excited. Why was I excited? Because he just taught us this technique called exponential smoothing. And I was so excited about it because it's a way of forecasting the future of a trend without saving all of the old data. And in the mid-1980s, you couldn't save all the old data, and the computer couldn't crunch it up even if you saved it, right? So this is a really neat tool to do that. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, every week at work, I spend hours with an inventory reorder report, looking at each line. Do I need to order more, not too much, too low? Hours doing this. And I'm sitting there thinking, I could code this in basic and get this into a program like that night and take what was hours and bring it down to minutes. So I'm excited. And then this kid next to me rolls his eyes and he says, this stuff is so stupid to his buddy. If I ever had to use this stuff, I'd just hire somebody. And I was going to use that stuff before my head hit the pillow that night. But foolish youth, you know, he was 22. He was a kid. I was way older. I was 24. <laughs> now, about a month after I graduated from Hayward State, I thought, you know, I should probably keep this education thing going. And I'd heard about this local outfit that had an MBA program up in Moraga. So once I kind of made a decision, I figured in a few days I would call. Well, it wasn't a few days, probably a few weeks. Maybe, maybe it was a month. But I, I finally placed the call. And I called up right here, and I said, I'm interested in getting an MBA at St. Mary's. And I said, well, we're very sorry. You're two days too late. That program just closed, and it's not opening up for six months. It was a really long time. And they kind of heard, you know, the, oh, man, I kind of wanted to get going a little bit sooner. And then she said, but we have this executive MBA program. Would you be interested in that? You know, are you qualified? And in fact, I was technically qualified. I've had five years managerial experience. I've been a CEO for two years already. And, and so they said, well, if you're interested, you need to get up here by noon tomorrow because that's when it closes. And we can set an appointment to meet with the director of admissions, a man named Nelson Shelton, and we can get a, a, an ex-student there as well, and we'll talk about it. So I said yes and set the appointment. Now, I hung up the phone and I was really, really nervous because I knew I wasn't an executive. I was 25, I was running a business in a warehouse, it wasn't a fancy place, it wasn't corporate, and I knew what executives were, you see. Executives all wore three-piece suits, and they ran major corporations, and they were very, very serious, and they knew everything about business, and so I'm thinking, oh my, am I going to be able to manage this, getting in a room with executives? But it didn't stop me from coming up the next day, so I sat down with Nelson, and we chatted a little bit, and he kind of took a look at this 25-year-old guy sitting there. And and then he challenged me. He said, Rob, you're going to be sitting in a room with executives. They expect you to contribute to them. And they're going to give back to you. But are you really confident that you can contribute at the level they will and be really a part of the cohort? And it's a lockstep program. It's kind of a scary thing. You're lock, locked in. So in my heart, you know, no way, I, I, never, I never met an executive, you know, I, no way. And in my head, intellectually, 
I didn't think I'd actually ever work with an executive. I didn't intellectually know whether I could stand up to it or not. But you know, in those instances, you got like a second to figure it out, right? So I'm talking here, but you know, it all happens really fast. So I looked up and I looked Nelson in the eye and I said, absolutely, I could clearly contribute that not a thing to worry about. And he bought it and I was in. And you know what? The words that came out of my mouth were right. And the, the insecurities and the uncertainties in my heart and my head, they were wrong. Because I was able to learn what I needed to learn. And I was able to practice what I was learning and teach and contribute. In fact, the, one of the first challenges was accounting. And I don't know what the program orientation is now. One of the first classes. And there was kind of a scary looking accounting professor at the time. And, and so I got in there. But you know what? I had just learned accounting as an undergraduate. And I'd been practicing real accounting in that business I'd been running in that warehouse. And so when there was some debit and credit confusion, we had a little study group. And I was able to help out my peers and get through the debit and credit kinds of problems. I remember uh, another incident when Christine, it was Christine, who went, who, who, who stormed out of the statistics class crying at the Greek that was statistics. And I was able to help her translate it just a little bit into English. Towards the end of the program, there's the capstone course, right? It's the strategy course. And, you know, everybody's always worried about the capstone course. And, and what they did then is they got three of the students together to analyze one business. And so I got two other students to analyze my business, a business unit that I'd started about a year earlier during the program. And as I'm reading Michael Porter's book on uh, the structure of industries, I'm, I'm, I'm shaken, right? Because what Michael is saying is, is what I, I shouldn't have done, that business unit, right? It's structurally unsound. Oh my, I was getting really nervous. And so we all do this report and the, the professor required that each of us would do a separate uh, opinion, not just the joint opinion. In my two classmates, it just ripped up my business. I mean, I was just a plane heading down. The crater was waiting for me. So I was on pins and needles when I got back to the professor's comments, because that was all I would have needed is him to say, yep, you're going down too. But he was kinder, and he said, you know, there could be some exceptions, and there could be some ways this could work. And the good news is, for 23 years, it really did work. And that business grew, and, and was very, and is very, very successful. So at the end, at graduation, I was really, really um, surprised and delighted when my classmates got together, unbeknownst to me, and voted to award me the Jack Saloma Award for Student Citizenship. What that meant was that they decided that I had contributed more to my fellow peers than anybody else in the class. And I'm really proud about this award because it says that I gave back to my peers. And I was able to give back to my team because I learned and practiced and taught all compressed into one 21-month MBA program. They told you it's 21 months, didn't they? <laughs> nah, they shortened it up for you guys. Now, 1988 to 1992 were really hard years for my business. That, that business unit that I started, it did struggle at first, and there was it's, slowly got traction and some of the other business units you know, kind of dropped away and it, it clicked in just in the nick of time, to be honest. And in 1992, I got married to my lovely wife there, Renee, and kept cranking away at the business. And, and even as, as um, 1995 came along, we were still really cash constrained. And so the business re 